pledge and remain standing. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you. Let's have a moment of silence, please. Thank you. Uh, roll call. Mayor Dickey. Here. Vice Mayor Spellich. Present. Council Member McMahon. Here. Council Member Charno. Present. Council Member Magazine. Here. Council Member Friedel. Here. Council Member Grisbowski. Here. Thank you all. Our first item as usual, the reports by town manager, mayor and council. Uh, Grady? Yes, uh, Mayor, I'll be very brief. Um, I just want to let the council know that um, we had a bit of, of good news and that we were um, went through the selection process with Maricopa Association of Governments on some of the regional transportation projects. These would be road projects, um, arterials, um, and freeway projects that are going to be in the reauthorization of Prop 400. And um, we made the cut for basically three projects. We had two widening projects of Shea and also the reconstruction of Palisades from Shea um, down to Saguaro. And just wanna let you know, while that sounds good right now, um, there's obviously not gonna be enough money to go around if a half cent cent is still reauthorized. And so there's gonna be further review and prioritization, but I felt very good. There were hundreds of projects from communities in the Valley that ended up not making what they call the um, the line or, or the cut. And so we at least had three out of the, I believe it was five that were able to make it. So I felt very good um, both with the staff and those that helped us uh, do this. That's all I have, Mayor. Thank you. Thank you, Mayor. I was recently appointed to the uh, uh, Maricopa Association of Governments uh, Regional Domestic Violence Council and uh, learned some interesting things going through the first uh, video with them and did send you and Grady an email. So we're working on some stuff for the town on that. So I just wanted to bring that up. Thank you, Councilman. I'm really glad that you're stepped up and uh, I know we, we were involved with it several years ago and now I'm, I'm looking forward to our, our continued participation. Anybody else? Yes, Councilwoman. I sat through a few things the past couple of weeks. EPCOR did a series of community meetings regarding their rate change proposal. In short, it's exactly what we saw with the council however many months ago that was. Sat in on the Fountain Hills Biolithic Cities again, the Arizona Association of Economic Development, the current state of economic development and the changing face of site selection, which was very interesting, talking about the California businesses and the other businesses that are moving in and how things are changing a little bit with, with the COVID. Phoenix East Valley did an economic development aviations committee meeting, which was great. That was about site selection as well. And the National League of Cities, the role of municipal leaders in addressing disparities, which was cool. And that's it. Thank you uh, very much for sitting in and listening to all those and uh, um, really appreciate it because as we know that, that so many of us have been joining these different groups and um, as we get more used to what we're doing, it's, it's really helpful. We get these great ideas. Um, any other reports? Uh, yes, Mike. Well, just real quick, uh, chamber ribbon cutting last week. It was on the patio outside the chamber office and um, send out cards was the uh, business, kind of a home-based business, but uh, internet and uh, good little turnout there. And then uh, we did have a traffic and safety committee meeting and pretty lengthy agenda. I won't get into that. And I don't know if you will, but uh, that was uh, got a lot accomplished at that meeting. So, Thank you, Mike. I wanted to welcome you and Peggy as members of that committee, uh, pedestrian traffic safety. And um, we report to the council um, I don't know how regularly, but that's what we'll do, because you're right, there was a lot of stuff on there. Um, I, I was able to have a talk with, with, with Senator Mark Kelly. He's the first time, because I was uh, talked mostly to Senator Sinema, but he's new, and um, talked about COVID relief, the next bill, 
uh, infrastructure in Fountain Hills, including Wi-Fi and a lot of the things that we talk about. And um, it's just great to have that open communication. Um, I wanted to, uh, I appreciate residents that are uh, anxious about COVID and the vaccines. And, you know, we're, we're trying every day, the captain, uh, the, the fire chief, we all continue to work on trying to get uh, what they call pop-up uh, sites here uh, that are a little bit more local, but you've probably noticed that some of the grocery stores and pharmacies and like Honor Health and these other places, and even some doctors here in town are starting to, um, to uh, administer the vaccine. So that's uh, good news, we'll continue. Uh, trying and, and making sure that everybody that wants one gets one. Um, and, and Maricopa County went down to the 65 year olds now. So uh, that was uh, able to get more people involved. Um, we are reevaluating um, regularly our COVID protocols. I know everybody's anxious about the fair and things like that. And um, the numbers are, are, are really getting better every day. And so Grady and all of us will be continuing and Rachel to, to uh, reevaluate as we go forward um, to see what, what, if any changes can be made. Um, and I wanted to uh, just address something because somebody uh, had said that we weren't being um, as open as we could be, but I think you know there are several cities that have been, some of them haven't even had a, a true open meeting since March, so I feel like we've, uh, tried our uh, our best, you know, we kind of had fits and starts, but we did have several open meetings and um, I have asked for call to the public at every meeting and we've had Zoom and we've had online comments well in advance of the meeting so that people, you know, we, we usually put the agenda out like Wednesday or Thursday the week before so that folks really did have an opportunity. It's not perfect, we know that, but we're gonna get there. Um, but I did wanna address that because I don't feel that we've been uh, hiding anything or doing anything uh, untoward in that way. Um, and then last, I just want to mention Arizona Health, azhealth.gov slash find vaccine is, a, is a kind of an overall place to see <coughs> if some things are starting to pop up. And of course, calling that 211. So, um, and if you have any questions, of course, you can always email us or look on our website. We have uh, a lot of people working on this to, to try to get us all through it as best as possible. Any questions from anybody? Thank you. We'll go on to um, a proclamation, which um, was a request that I had from the uh, United States Conference of Mayors. And I'm gonna read it now. It says, whereas the first Monday in March has been designated as COVID-19 Victims and Survivors Memorial Day, and COVID-19 is an illness caused by a virus that can transmit from person to person and has spread across the world, creating a global pandemic that is having effects on human life, our community, and our economy. And whereas to mitigate the spread of COVID, observance of public health orders to social distance and stay at home have created challenges for small businesses, workers, schools, which are working to comply with limited resources. And whereas school districts, teachers, students, and parents are grappling with the challenges of distance learning and working to prevent any potential learning loss due to not being in person. And whereas local and state governments, health departments, and public servants have taken actions to protect residents, support struggling local economies and find innovative ways to provide services. And whereas in response to the rapid spread of COVID and stay at home orders, essential workers have stepped up to provide critical services to help protect our communities and save lives, sacrificing their own health and safety. And where COVID has had a disproportionate impact on low income communities and communities of color, exacerbating inequities already prevalent in our systems that we must address as a nation and whereas the symptoms and severity of COVID can vary dramatically by individual and with long-term health implications for survivors, it's largely unknown as many survivors suffer with lingering side effects of this disease after they no longer test positive. And whereas each life lost to COVID mattered and leaves a hole in the hearts of their loved ones, family members, and surrounding community. And whereas public health guidance and policies targeted at prevention, such as vaccine distribution, distancing, uh, masks, staying home, help mitigate the spread of COVID, prevent illness, and with effective treatment, lessen the burden on individuals, healthcare providers, and society. Therefore, be it resolved that the town of Fountain Hills joins cities and towns across the country in support of the United States Conference of Mayors designation of the first Monday in March as COVID-19 Memorial Day in remembrance of those who have lost their lives and in honor of those who continue to suffer from the impact of this virus. 
past this day, 16th day of February 2021. If you have any questions about that, you can um, ask me later. Um, okay, our next is a report from John Kraft about the Strategic Planning Advisory Commission. Is he on? Um, Thank you, Mayor. Uh, I believe John is actually um, in Zoom. Um, he is the chair of the Strategic Planning Advisory Commission, and he wishes to give the council kind of a status update as to where uh, SPAC is right now on doing an update to the um, 2017 strategic plan. John, are you on? I am. Great. Can you hear me? Yes, you're coming across very well. Hi, welcome. Thank you. Uh, are we ready to go? Wonderful. Uh, Mayor Dickey, council members, thank you for uh, giving us the opportunity to give you an update uh, with regard to our progress uh, in quotes with the strategic plan. Uh, like you, I think you understand that we've been dealing with the COVID virus and the challenges that it's presented to us as we move forward. Um, I should tell you that uh, I was nominated as chair back in uh, late fall of 2019 for the commission. Uh, had I known I'd be dealing with COVID and other challenges, um, I might have just stayed a member of the commission, but uh, it's been a great and rewarding process. We've also uh, added three new members of our commission uh, since the last time we spoke, if I'm not mistaken. And one of the, we lost one member who's sitting up there on the dais with you right now. Uh, because we had new members um, and we really began to think about from the plan's perspective, uh, what's really important in terms of moving forward. And it was important for me to have everybody basically operating from the same page and have a good understanding in terms of where we've been and the direction that seems to make sense moving forward. Grady's provided uh, a lot of direction and support in helping us with that. But we began this process in late fall of 19 in early 2020 by going through an orientation process. And that included reviewing the 2017 plan, the current plan that's in play right now, uh, and really taking a look at what were the hits? What did we do well and where did we miss? Uh, we asked uh, three of our newest members of our commission uh, to revisit the SWOT analysis that was used as a basis for much of the work that we did in the current plan and we felt it was time to have it updated. And at the same time, we also spent a fair amount of time looking at the progress with our recently passed general plan. We wanted to make sure that anything we did moving forward was not going to be redundant or conflict with uh, the primary aspects of that particular plan. And lastly, uh, a few of us, uh, specifically, um, Peter and myself, Peter Bordeaux, uh, who's the vice chair, uh, have uh, been interacting on a regular basis with the Vision Fountain Hills folks. Uh, as those of you that were around back in 2015 and 16, uh, we worked in collaboration with the Vision folks, uh, specifically for outreach to the community to get feedback from community members uh, to help us in our planning efforts. Uh, our intent was to do this moving forward. Uh, then COVID hit. Um, with that, uh, we are still moving forward, but um, on three cylinders instead of four right now. Uh, the first thing that we wanted to do after everyone seemed to be comfortable with the direction we're going was to establish, I felt, some basic plan, what I call plan basics. And anything that we're looking to develop or work forward on needs to satisfy three basic elements. It has to be manageable from the standpoint of the town and the community. It has to be measurable and lastly attainable. And uh, with that understanding, um, we began to work forward with regard to developing a, at least a basic understanding of how we want to reach the 2021 planning. And the basic elements of that plan really must encompass an overarching value of focusing on strengthening our community and improving our overall quality of life. Any strategies moving forward or tactics might be able to handle that. Um, 
once COVID hit, uh, we started to lose track a little bit as far as meetings because everyone was basically quarantined. Uh, we tried to resolve some of those concerns by forming three work groups. And so each of our work groups had anywhere from two to three members of the commission and they worked independently on specific areas to help us. And we, uh, when we did have an opportunity to interact either in meeting or in conversation, uh, provided updates. Those three work groups, uh, in keeping with what I've already shared with you, our basics and our plan elements, have identified, and uh, I think Mayor Dickey, you and Grady also uh, were supportive of the, the four strategic priorities that we are going to utilize with the new plan as we move forward and develop tactics. And those strategic priorities are obviously to continue to maintain and support our infrastructure uh, with the particular emphasis on enhancing our digital capacity in the community. The reason for that in part is that technology is changing so quickly and as we look to uh, identify business opportunities and recognize that businesses and individuals are doing more work from home, the need for improved digital capacity is becoming quite imperative. Uh, the second priority is financial sustainability. Uh, third is to improve the overall community's health, well-being, and safety. And lastly, to establish a, and I underline this, targeted and collaborative economic development strategy. I'll pause for a minute, see if anyone has any questions. Anybody would like to ask a question at this point? Not yet. Thanks. All right. Uh, as, as we move forward with those, those four strategic priorities in our meetings, we had begun meetings with uh, a number of individuals and uh, enterprises within our community to get feedback from them, such as the Chamber of Commerce, um, the Civic and Culture Association, some of the political groups in town and religious groups to help us kind of form uh, an understanding uh, those of you that were able to take the Vision Fountain Hills survey for 2020 uh, may recognize as well that that survey, which was launched in late summer um, and was closed up in mid fall, uh, we had a little over 600 uh, respondents to that survey and much of the survey was geared around looking at uh, specific assets features and services that our community are, are provided with and having individuals basically offer their, their sense for how important those particular assets are. And secondly, how well are we performing in terms of delivering those services or maintaining those assets? You can go to the visionfountains.org website and see this, the summary survey of the 600 respondents at your convenience. It is now posted there. And much of that information was helpful for us in terms of beginning to identify um, what we're calling specific strategies. And the format that right now we're looking to, to move forward with uh, is a recognition, number one, that the 2017 plan still has a number of tactics uh, programs that are either still in progress or have not been addressed. And rather than just put them in the wastebasket, we're revisiting which ones we think need to be rolled over and continued with the plan as long as they are consistent with the four strategic priorities that we already established. So we're doing that. But in addition to that, we have, through our work groups, begun to identify anywhere from six to eight, what I'm going to call signature strategies, which will be new strategies. Uh, the digital capacity piece is one example. Uh, some opportunities with economic development as well uh, that we'll be looking at. And those signature strategies will be incorporated into the plan as we move forward. Now, the last thing that uh, we had hoped and still hope to be able to do is get additional community feedback. And the challenge we've had, obviously, is the challenge that we all have. It's, it's getting people, number one, interested. It's been a great distraction with the COVID and with the political climate in the nation uh, over the last year. And uh, 
as you remember, those of you that were here in 2016, we actually were able to bring 110 community volunteers together at the community center for a day long workshop and session, which proved quite uh, successful. Uh, the challenge today is we're not going to probably do that unless we wait until this unfortunate COVID thing has been has been brought to bear. Uh, so we've been looking at virtual reality or virtual workshops or focus groups as an option. Um, we have several ideas that we want to move forward with and utilize the town's technology to help us with that. Uh, looking at formats similar to what Parks and Rec recently did in terms of their online survey and then follow up. Uh, the challenge, our perspective right now that we're still working through and is pending is that uh, many of the key members of the Vision Fountain Hills group either developed COVID or in the process of moving into their new home, uh, number one, or lost family members and are not as available to help us proceed forward. So uh, Grady and I have had some conversations about the possibility of having the uh, SWAT group um, maybe take a lead in this particular activity. Our hope is to be able to have at least an initial round of workshops or focus groups completed uh, by April, by early April, so that we can still track getting something to this council and to the mayor and to Grady sometime in, in May, June, uh, with enough information to assist in you as you move forward in your budget planning. And with that, I will yield to any questions you have. Thank you so much, John. Any questions from anybody on the panel here? No? Grady, do you have anything you'd like to add? Uh, no, I just think that um, John, the way he's outlined um, next steps is it's outstanding. Um, it, they have had these setbacks and despite the setbacks, um, there's a high energy level on the part of the commissioners and they're coming up with alternatives to try to move forward. They, they do have some really good, some ideas. And I think that they've narrowed down the, the four top priorities that John just shared with you. And I think, I think all of you would agree that those are really um, very important to have as the overarching um, priorities for the next plan. So I have no other comments. Thank you, Grady. The um, partnership with the Vision Fountain Hills and Strategic Plan Commission and the council and of course the public has been uh, a continuous uh, positive force in the town since we started in 2006 or whatever. And um, I wanted to you know, mention that we are having our retreat on um, the 23rd, um, I think 8.30. And of course with COVID, you know, we're, we're doing it online and all, but um, we really hope that you, John, and everyone um, see see what, we're ta what we talk about and make sure that we incorporate the ideas that you are bringing to us. Um, it's, it's so important to have a, you know, something there that everything ties to. And uh, we do it with the budget, and we do it with strategic plan and with some of the other things that, that, we, that we move forward to our capital improvement and our budget and everything. So um, please know how appreciated you are and uh, we continue our discussions and our conversations and, uh, and feel free to always contact us if you need anything. All right, well, thank you all for your time. Thank you. Our next item is the consent agenda, unless anybody would like something removed. Could I have a motion? Mm -hmm. We have a motion and a second. All those in favor, please say aye. 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 Any opposed? <coughs> thank you. Uh, the regular agenda, our first item is about uh, precision sweeping. Grady and Justin? Yes, thank you, Mayor. Um, as the Mayor indicated, this item is for um, our, our street sweeping services contract. Several years ago, our public works department actually used to provide this function. We had staff and street sweeping equipment. But as a, um, after an evaluation of the services and what it cost to actually provide this in-house versus um, outsourcing, it was determined that it was a much more economical way to deliver this service um, through outsourcing. Um, this contract before you is for a four-year term. Um, I'm going to turn it over to Justin Weldy, who has additional details about the particular contract before you and what it entails. Mr. Weldy. Thank you, Mr. Miller, Madam Mayor, Vice Mayor, Council Members. 
I'm going to add some additional information in regards to the town manager's opening statement. While we, we face the challenge financially, the second challenge, and we certainly did not expect this, was our ability to procure and secure and maintain street sweeping. It has created challenges over the last 10 plus years in being able to keep someone on staff or rather under contract. Initially, our first request for proposals went unanswered. We then reached out to other municipal uh, cities and counties and finally convinced someone to come on board. Since that time, we've obviously, those contracts have ended for various reasons. The one that we're discussing tonight is another one of those opportunities where the city of Mesa released this. They had some solicitations and precision sweeping was clearly their selection. We invited them out to the town of Fountain Hills and discussed our needs with them. And based on the needs that were discussed, they sent us a proposal. Having read the proposal, shared it with the town manager and finance, we believe that the proposal that we're moving forward here is in the best interest and affordable to the town. <clears throat> I think it's important to note that while this contract is higher than the Mesa contract, there are clearly a few reasons behind that. The town of Fountain Hills has about 1,200 plus or minus center lane miles, and the city of Mesa has approximately 16,000. So the negotiated price we're working for, or we're asking for permission to use, is about $62 a center line mile. I should also note that the previous contract that we utilized that is no longer available, it was not renewed, was $60. So it's about $2 more a centerline mile. The difference is a few thousand dollars a year. And, and I should note that while the overall cost for this is just under $80,000, we're asking for approval for $90,000. The reason for that is we also have them for emergency sweeping in the event that we need it. This contract is also very detailed in regards to spills, um, petroleums and those types of things that need to be cleaned up and properly disposed of are also covered in this contract. And also our special events. One of the things that staff was impressed with was this one was their special event sweeping and also their on-call sweeping. All of the previously utilized contracts had a four hour minimum. This contract does not have a four hour minimum and their cost for emergency and on-call is about $10 less per hour than the one that we previously used. <clears throat> with that said, if there are any questions that I can answer, I will certainly do so to the best of my ability. Yeah, um, Justin, uh, maybe I wasn't paying enough attention, but the $90,000 figure uh, got my attention. What was that again? Madam Mayor, Council Member Magazine, the contract total is, is $79,840. We are asking for $90,000, and the additional funding in there will be utilized for emergencies, including but not limited to a storm, should we have one, and we need assistance to clean that up or for special events, and these are town-sponsored, not permitted events if we have a special event, or unfortunately, if there is a spill of some sort and we need their assistance to clean that up. Is this, the, is this an augment to the staff report? I don't see 90,000 in the staff report. Unless I, it's actually in there. If you look it at here? it, it's... Uh, it's uh, my mistake. Okay, thank you. Any other questions? Yes, Mike. Justin, I know uh, years back when the town was doing it ourselves, um, you guys had a special thing down there at the street yard to dump all the materials. You, you know, you couldn't dump it in washes and that kind of thing. So I assume this contract, they kind of take care of all that on their own, or do you guys work with them on the disposal of what they pick up? Madam Mayor, Council Member, and, and that is an excellent point to bring up. In the past, in order to comply with state and county rules and regulations, we had a street sweeper car wash, it's referred to as a decant station, 
you simply cannot rinse or clean or dump a street sweeper anywhere and except for an approved container and a reclaiming container. What it was was a car wash that reclaimed everything, the solids were removed and we shipped them to a separate location. In this case, they actually will place a dumpster at the street yard and for each of their cycles, they will return to the street yard as often as necessary and fill that dumpster. And that dumpster is exclusive to them and provided by them. And then when that dumpster is filled, it will be shipped to an approved landfill for disposal. And I know you covered it in the staff report, but maybe quickly for benefit of the public, you could just review besides obvious storm cleanup, I mean, why street sweeping is needed. Um, yeah, I know there's a lot of environmental and, and <coughs> dust uh, regulations that we need to meet, so maybe just quickly go over that. Absolutely. As under the Clean Air Act from the EPA, they set the national standards for air quality for a particular matter, which is referred to as PM10, and oftentimes you'll hear staff use that. We must adhere to it when performing street sweeping. A street sweeper must be certified by the Southern Coast Air Quality Management District and remain compliant following guidelines set forth by the Arizona Department of Environmental Quality. There's also a separate component to that. By street sweeping our streets on a regular basis, we pick up the sediment that is washed out um, from over irrigating or accidental uh, broken irrigation lines in our residential and also for just your everyday basic wind and dust and traffic that place debris out on the street by removing and picking up those items, we are minimizing our PM10, our particulate matter, and keeping the dust level low and creating a healthy -er environment for our community in doing so. Uh, how often is, is it going to take place? And are, what are we doing right now? Anything or is just, and when is this gonna start if we're not doing anything? Madam Mayor, Council Member, we are currently using the previous contract sweeper okay. and we are paying them outside of a contract with an agreement based on the other one. The way the process works is they will do the residential streets every eight weeks and our arterials and collectors every three weeks. And the new contract will start as soon as it's, uh, if it's approved here tonight, it will go through our accounting software and all the necessary signatures. We will send them a notice to proceed and a purchase order and most likely begin, if not early next week, the following week. Okay, thank you. You're welcome. Thank you, any other questions? Okay, could I get a motion please? It's on page 18. I'll go ahead and move to approve contract uh, C-2021-033 between the town and Precision Sweeping Services in the amount of 90000 annually for street sweeping services. I'll second. Thank you. All those in favor, please say aye. 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 Any opposed? Thanks. Thanks a lot, Justin. You're welcome. Thank you. Okay. Our next is actually a contract for emergency replacement of playground equipment. Uh, great Thank you, Rachel. Mayor. Um, Rachel and I will tag team this. Um, I want to let you know that um, due to some failing um, uh, children's playground equipment over at Fountain Park, um, this is a really important need to try to get replaced as soon as possible. Um, also, based on an assessment of the other equipment, it's very obvious that it's not holding up to what we believe to be the original um, useful life of it. And normally, um, in cases like this, if we don't have the time, we'll go ahead and have um, the manager go ahead and do an emergency procurement and then come back to you with a ratification to approve my uh, decision. But since we had time to actually bring this to you and for you to make a decision and authorize me to do the contract, it saves a few steps here. I'm gonna turn it over to uh, Rachel Goodwin, our community services director, who has more details about the equipment um, in question, and then what we're planning on doing um, with the additional funding that we're requesting from you tonight. Thank you, Grady. Um, and I am working on getting our presentation up. Um, I'm having some issues, some difficulties here, some technical difficulties, if you will. Um, Rachel, I'm something I'd be interested, I think, of council to learn is that 
the, the funding source of this and where it's coming from and the fact that it's been kind of a planned replacement. So you wanna share a little bit about the, sure. the funding source? Sure, let's start there. Um, and then if I can ask for Mike's help, I would appreciate it. <laughs> um, the, the idea here is we do, we have a playground down at Fountain Park. I'm sure everyone is familiar with it. Um, it's actually a set of two playgrounds. One is geared for our five to 12, or excuse me, our, yes, our five to 12 year olds, our big kids, if you will. And then we have a small kids playground geared for two to five. Um, and it's the two to five that we're working on tonight. I don't know what I'm doing. Wrong. See, it's not just me. Um, and then, so what we've done is, essentially we found, an, we found a deterioration. We found um, some damage um, that poses a safety concern. Once that was identified, we began the standard process for replacement. What we found, however, was that the replacement piece was far exceeded what we expected, and it became apparent that there was additional failures that were coming down the pike. We were able to see where there was things that were rusting, there were other elements, thanks Mike, um, that were aging, and it became, so we did a, a site visit, we actually took um, our finance director down, we were able to meet with Grady, and identify that we do have the funding to replace the full piece um, as opposed to just the, the one element in question. And I, again, I have some photos just because I know that oftentimes photos help tell the story better. So as I mentioned, we have the two playgrounds. They were installed in 2005, just to kind of give you a point of reference. They're about 16 years old. Um, generally speaking, uh, the life span, lifespan of a playground in our desert is usually somewhere about 12 years, give or take. Um, 15 would be really the end of that spectrum, if you will. It is our most heavily used playground in our community, no surprise there, because it is at Fountain Park, and it's consistently used in a year round. Here's a picture, this is our two to five side. Um, you can kind of see from the back angle here where that orange snow fencing is, that kind of gives you an idea of what is actually damaged, it's the stairs, um, the stairway through the back of the dinosaur, or the alligator there. This is a close up, you can see where the steps have cracked and they've started to um, crack all the way through. And, and that's just through normal wear and tear use, kids um, climbing up and down and um, whatnot. But you can see that there's other deterioration happening here. Um, you can see where there's rusting, you can see where there's um, points of failure that we're um, noting. Now we do playground inspections every two weeks, we do them twice a month. Um, so this is, uh, again, this was notif caught during one of our standard inspections. Um, so no, we did not have any issues or complaints or anything from our public but it is our job to make sure that our equipment is in safe and meets all playground safety standards. So once it was discovered, we began taking note of additional things um, and again, kind of taking it into perspective of what makes sense fiscally. You can kind of see the slides here, they're also beginning to crack, um, again, through use and age. So we, again, we noted it during our inspections. Um, we took immediate steps, obviously, to secure the area, and then we began those replacement efforts. And it's roughly ten to twelve thousand dollars to replace that set of stairs. It's not, it's, it's not the dinosaur. They don't make them anymore. Um, the replacement parts for a sixteen-year-old playground are kind of hard to come by. Um, so, given the age of all of the components, that's when we began to have a conversation with our town manager and our finance to see if our facility reserve fund had the means to replace the entire structure. And that's where we are this evening, is recommending that. In your packets, you have this photo, um, which is the recommended structure that we are looking at. Um, it's much larger than the structure we have now, um, and it accommodates uh, more kids. It, it meets better safety standards right now, and we actually have worked with the vendor to develop a pretty significant discount um, in order to, uh, to take advantage of our situation and as they know that we need a replacement and we are looking to do something um, in, a, in a very quick and timely fashion. So they were able to work with us and they also, this is not in your packet, this is actually something I received earlier today and this is a rendering of what the piece would look like within our park. We would not have the shade canopies because we already have existing shade canopies which help bring the cost down as well. So this is uh, the color palette that it would use, and this is a, a rendering of what the piece would potentially look like in Fountain Park. I have a question, please. Yes, ma'am. Shade canopies. Mm -hmm. There aren't any, or are they the big yellow ones that So have? that's a great question. Um, and in, in some of the photos, you can see that we already have existing shade canopies, and those are the yellow ones that you're mentioning. Mm -hmm. um, so the piece in this picture, this is kind of their stock image, and you can kind of see that it has those sort of built-in 
uh, we would not, we would remove those. We wouldn't order a piece that has those because we already have the existing shade canopies in place. So it, ours would look, again, more like this structure here. Thank you. Thank you for clarifying. Uh, we recognize that this is a little, um, it's a big ask. Um, as opposed to just replacing the piece. But again, um, staff and with Grady's support and the support of our fin finance department, believe that this is a more prudent way to proceed for replacement of an element of this type. Can you tell me um, what effect the sun and the UV has on our playground equipment, if any? Well, does it does it take a in fact the reason I'm asking that question is um, I'm wondering if there's a product or a process that we can use when we get this new equipment to help um, mitigate that. Sure, uh, that's a great question. Thank you, Council Member. Um, to my knowledge, that is partially why we do the shade canopies, the large structure shade canopies, because they do provide some UV filtration there. They do extend the life of our playgrounds. That's why we do make those types of investments. It's why we proposed one several weeks ago for the new playground equipment at Four Peaks Park, again, with the intention of providing some of that filtration. Uh, the products have come a long way, obviously 16 years ago versus what they're doing today. There is built in UV strategies, and this is a product that we've used or a vendor we've used previously and have held up nicely in our parks. Um, unfortunately, UV aside, we do still experience I don't remember how many days it was last year, over 120, but we have significant heat here um, that takes a toll on our, on our products, which is why the lifespan is usually roughly between 12 to 15 years. Sometimes it's forecasted as far as 20, but generally speaking, in a desert climate like ours, we don't see 20 years. If I may, too, um, good, good response back. And Jerry, um, excellent um, you know, point that you brought up. We're fortunate because while our climate is very difficult on this type of equipment, plastics surprisingly hold up pretty well in the, in the desert. They're also not hot to the touch like, like the metal surfaces are for kids in our, our hot summers and all that. But where we have the failures, what I've seen over time um, is that it's the structural parts. So it's where you have the connectivities with steps or the underbelly, the underside that you don't really see that's sometimes where you have the failures. It's not so much on the, the top surfaces, although we did see it with the, um, the stairs or the steps, but really the, the amenities themselves, you typically don't really see failure unless there's vandalism or something else that has helped reduce the life. Um, so we've been very fortunate on that. And I do think plastics, you know, a lot of people have different strong opinions about plastics, but I do think plastics really for playground equipment are really, they're soft touch to the kids. They fall on it, it's, it's less harmful than some of the metal surfaces. And then the temperature um, is much easier on, on the kids as well. And I think with our canopies, it also helps with reducing perhaps some of the fade that you might see over time. Any other questions for Rachel or Grady? No? Thank you. Um, if you're ready for a motion, I'll take it. Page 86. <laughs> Move to authorize the town manager to execute a contract for the emergency replacement of playground equipment in Fountain Park in the amount not to exceed $60,000. Thank you. Thank you. All in favor, please say aye. 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 Any opposed? Thank you. Thank Thanks you. a lot. Our next item is the item, of course. We're going to continue discussing our sign ordinance. Grady, West, I'll be very quick in the introduction. Um, as you recall, back on January 19th, the council had an opportunity to um, hear a presentation from John Wesley, our, our development services director. And um, we believe we're going to have a couple steps before we finalize um, to, to bring to you a final um, draft uh, sign ordinance. But what John did do at the last meeting, he was listening very intently. And on those items that he believed he heard and left with consensus, he brought back those to you. And then there's others that were, he's not quite sure he's going to try to get um, you to fine tune a little bit more on the direction. With that I'm going to turn it over to Mr. Wesley, who has um, his comments and presentation for tonight. Good evening, Mayor and Council. Glad to be with you again. Appreciated the good discussion last time and 
Look forward to some more discussion and direction from your uh, review this evening with the uh, added comments I've been able to provide back to you based on, as Mr. Mr. Uh, Miller said, uh, trying to hear what the different points and, and ideas were and, and where we might need to look at some possible changes. Again, we are looking to get uh, some level of consensus or understanding of, of what do we want to see in a sign code. We will be back for the actual public hearing at some point in the future uh, for you to make a decision on the code. And again, depending upon how much change that you make, I'll be discussing with our town attorney whether or not we need to go back to P&Z for their review of any of these uh, and further recommendation before we come back. So you can't say exactly how long it would be, but hopefully it wouldn't take too long. So uh, with that, um, I've got, I think it's uh, seven or eight different items that I put into the memo and that are now reflected into this PowerPoint presentation that were the key topics uh, that I heard uh, in the discussion last time. And so with each of these slides, what I've tried to do is give again a little bit of background about what the current ordinance says, then what was put in the uh, new ordinance of the similar topic, and where I see maybe some, some opportunities to address the comments, and, and others are just left again for your further discussion and consideration. So uh, one of the points of discussion was the construction materials that are used uh, in the temporary signs, particularly the A-frames. And are they are maintaining a, a enough of a durable standard uh, for uh, those signs? So in particular, the current ordinance for the A-frames and uh, open house signs says this uh, minimum three-eighths inch material. Uh, and for garage sale signs, it says made uh, professional uh, made. So that worked okay in the current code, but when, again, when we switch, we're no longer content-based, and all we really have are two types of signs that are typically used for the garage sales and the open houses, the, either the A-frame or what we're now calling the yard sign, which are those smaller, usually a foam core kind of sign with the little metal legs that fit inside the foam core and then go in the ground, that kind of thing. Some of them are a little bit more substantial in, in all of metal. Those are the two basic things we're talking about yard signs and, or A-frames and, and the yard signs. A-frame signs, often used, you see them downtown, other places for businesses, um, and then uh, again, the open house garage sales. The ones that are the yard signs are a lot of times used for those things to the open house and the garage sales. They can be used for a wide variety of other things in terms of businesses putting them out. Uh, they can be the political signs, the signs we put out for, for zoning uh, changes and those types of things. So there are a wide variety of things uh, that they are used for, which again makes it maybe a little bit harder to, to regulate in this way. So we have three places where we are trying to, though, set a quality standard for those in the current code. One is the basic definition of what a temporary sign is. And so here you see in that definition the materials that it uh, needs to be made of, and um, so the, the plastic, canvas, vinyl, foam core, plywood, sheet metal, plastic, and other lightweight material, I'm suggesting to help strengthen that a little bit. We could say other durable lightweight material to help uh, keep it from being a light plastic or again, we'll talk a bit more about some of the uh, paper cardboard type things in a minute. We had an email suggestion that says maybe we ought to take out that other lightweight here and other places in the code so it is more specific about what those uh, types of material are. Uh, we could add thick plastic, but what's thick plastic um, type of thing. So, you know, there are a few words we could play with here if the council would like to try to strengthen that if you think that we need to in terms of that basic definition. When we go to the definition of A-frame, it is a little bit more specific in terms of the wood, sheet metal, or plastic. And again, here it says other lightweight. We could strengthen that other lightweight with other similar lightweight, so it kind of keeps it in that narrow range of the durable lightweight or get rid of that other lightweight piece. Then thirdly, as far as the kind of the things trying to keep it within a box and keep it controlled, we have the, the maintenance standard, which is uh, included elsewhere in the code in, in 607. We could add to that to say that um, paper, thin plastic, or cardboard are not permitted. And we could also um, add a little bit more to uh, the support systems that are used, because that's part of the issue. People look at these materials, and because we allow plastic, they use sometimes um, uh, clothes hampers or plastic buckets to put out and then stick their garage sale sign on. And so if we're trying to get away from those types of things, again, I think in, in the maintenance standard and, and back in the, the definition, we, we can do some things Councilman. there to, to limit those uh, with some of the, these ideas. 
Um, I don't know how you want to proceed. Can we ask questions as we go? Or would you that would be good. No, I think so. Which? Ask questions as, as we go. go. Yes. Yep. Um, I just think it could open Pandora's box. Um, I, I agree we should not use lightweight material. Um, and I'm not sure I know what durable means um, or other similar lightweight materials. I just think we have to button it down a little bit. Um, I just don't like the idea of leaving them somewhat up to the discretion of the people who are putting up the signs. Um, so that's something I would uh, I'd like to see considered. Uh, Councilwoman? I agree with the Councilman that it, durable is a little subjective. So I feel like we need to do what we can to be a little more objective. One of those things would be to list the items that are not considered permitted, which he has in his last bullet there. That would help. I don't really have any answers beyond that. It, I, I agree, yes. It, if I may, uh, looking at definition of temporary fabric, canvas, vinyl, foam core, plywood, sheet metal, plastic, isn't that enough? I mean, can't we just leave it at that? We could. It just, you know, yes, we could. Same with uh, A-frame requirements, wood, yes. sheet metal, plastic. I mean, I don't know why we can't just leave them with those designations. Okay. I have no issue with that. That's the direction of the council will. Councilman? Sorry. Yeah, I, uh, I tend to agree with that as well. If we start listing things that are not allowed, I mean, are we gonna, are we gonna cover everything? You know, that's, uh, so if we list the things we do allow and keep it as tight as we can, I think, you know, I don't, I don't want to give another 20 minute speech here. So I, I think, <laughs> I think as, as we go, you know, if, if we're not up to uh, banning any of this stuff, I think, you know, the, the more, the most strict that we can be and the most uh, direct and, and get the wording right. I mean, that's going to, going to help everybody, I think. So, um, and I even questioned the use of fabric and canvas. I, I'm not quite sure if I've ever seen, uh, I, you know, I, I don't think I'd, you okay. know, someone could put a, you know, sheet out on a, a plastic A-frame with magic marker. I, I mean, there's all kinds of ways to get around this stuff and I, I just, I don't know why we would need that. Uh, Mayor, council member, uh, the fabric and the canvas comes in primarily for banners and flags. The uh, other types, the, the yard signs and the post and board and the, and the A-frames clearly limit the materials to the wood, plastic, metal, those things. So that first one is the definition this, of temporary. This is the broad definition yeah. of temporary. And then with each specific type, we get a little bit more uh, direct. Oh, okay. I just, I, just don't, I just don't want to limit, I mean, include that for A-frames. So that's what threw me off. Right, so the A-frames and the... Um, what we consider yard signs, they, those would not be fabric or canvas. Correct. Okay. Let me look again Just at yard So we sign. know that. Okay, thank you. Any others then before we go on? Thank you. Okay, and then on the maintenance standards, do you want me to add in the no, no uh, cardboard, uh, plastic, uh, light plastic? Well, I think uh, on, what on, Mike on, was saying is that maybe just stage. by saying this is what you can make it okay. out of, if that's okay, okay with everybody? Good with that. Okay. Sounds good. Another discussion point last time was the time of use uh, for temporary signs. So the current ordinance for A-frames limits them from 7 a.m. to 9 p.m. Open house signs from sunrise to sunset. In garage sale, there's no time limit. So under the, again, under the current ordinance, we're basically talking about A-frames and yard signs. A-frames currently are listed as dawn to dusk. Yard signs, because the variety of things they can be used for, the contractor signs, uh, again, political signs, those things, we don't have a time limit for. And it would be a little bit more challenged if we tried to, uh, and then the, the residence directional signs, if we tried to limit it based on the message, right. then we've got a problem. So I just want to, I'll, I'll ask everybody what they think, but I want to offer perhaps having no sign time limits if we're going to pursue the right of way discussion. Because having an A-frame on your own property that you have to remove at, you know, nine or dawn to dusk, it's a little bit, you know, who knows what time that is um, necessarily. But so from what we had right now, it was like 
seven to nine or something. But really, if you think about if it's not if if we go down the route of not letting them be on rights away, would we care if they just left them out all the time at their house or at their business? And then we're not worried about trying to enforce it's nine o'clock, it's eight thirty, and that kind of thing. I have a question. Yes. Would that apply to residential and town? Or would we differentiate between them in town versus residential? Would in town be from dawn to dusk? Would residential not be regulated as far as how, if they can be up for 24 hours or 12 hours or whatever? When you say in town, do you mean commercial? Mm -hmm. Yes. Well, I guess in my opinion, if we didn't allow in rights away, I'd be okay with leaving them up everywhere all the time. I mean, what? When they take an A-frame down at nine o'clock at night, how you know? What's the purpose of that? Right now, if it's like at their store or at their, you know, you know what I'm saying? And then they put it back up at seven a.m. So if we're not allowing it with the clutter in the right away area, if we say you can just leave it up, so you have your store, you have your A-frame in front, but it's on your own property, why do we care? Or do we care if they take it down at 9 p.m. and put it back up at 7 a.m.? And we could say, well, it's going to eliminate a lot of the problem by not having having them in sidewalks and in rights away, if we're willing to do that aspect of it. If not, then that's another conversation. Okay, I understand what you're saying, but dawn to dusk, dusk changes. I mean, you know, it's later or earlier. Like right now, it's earlier. In the summer, it's later. So do you, do you want to have a specific time frame, no time frame, or because it, it's done to death, it just, it's, it's a variant, and it's, if they're in there right away, they're a hazard, but that's a different discussion. We're not there. But um, I don't know. I think it's either time-wise or specific time-wise or no time. Well, I, I want to hear from everybody, but I'm suggesting no timeline, but we're going to limit where they can be. Yes, Councilman. Don't most businesses take their signs down when they're when they're closing? I don't, I don't know. I don't see that many sitting out all night. There are, you do? There are some. What's that? There are some. There are some. It's the law right now to do it, <laughs> right? So, Mayor, so uh, so in a shopping small strip mall, then there's there's a frame signs. Uh, usually, there's some right away behind a sidewalk too, right? I mean, right. so you're saying, well, if we uh, make them put it on their property per se, then, I mean, I agree with you, then the, having them take them down doesn't really matter, right? Is that what you're saying? Mm -hmm. Well, even now, just think about what the purpose is of taking it down at nine, except that they don't want it stolen or something like that. but. Um, you know, and that would be up to their discretion, but it wouldn't be something we had to enforce. But, you know, right now, what is the purpose of them taking it down at 9 p.m. anyway? For, for the, you know, the, the use of the town or the look of the town. Hold on, uh, oh, Councilwoman sorry. first. I think I was just gonna nod my head in agreement that I, if it's on their property, other than their being worried about it walking in the middle of the night, why? why do they need to remove it? But the right-of-way conversation, that, like, like Peggy said, that's elsewhere. Mm -hmm. But no, I totally agree with that. Okay. Well, I just want to, I, I agree, and I think in part for another reason, which is we have two code enforcement officers with plenty to keep them busy. And so we, I don't think we need them going out uh, in the middle of the night to see, to enforce an ordinance where people have to take it down. Uh, this would free them up for we have some of their time for other uh, other inspections. What do you think, John? I think, uh, Mayor, as much as I, I appreciate the discussion, maybe we should need to go ahead and have that discussion about the right of way or the not right of way. I think that's maybe where the challenge comes because of uh, particularly, again, the open house signs and the garage sale signs and keeping those out of the right of way uh, is going to be a pretty big challenge. I think also when we look at the town center area, because the buildings come out to the property line, there really is no place for them to put their signs except in the right-of-way. 
uh, out on the sidewalk. So I think, again, that's uh, a discussion that, that maybe we need to have first before we decide this one. Because I think there are instances where it's going to be tough not to allow them in the, side, in the right of way. And maybe with Aaron, we can talk about what Gilbert does. Because um, that, that they don't allow in the rights of way, except for with a permit. So maybe that's a discussion that we can have. <laughs> so uh, can we move on right now? OK, thanks. So there we go. <laughs> Temporary signs in the right of way in median. <laughs> so um, the current ordinance allows it in the right of way, but not on a sidewalk and a parking place in the median. In the street, it must be at least one foot behind the curb or edge of pavement. As proposed in the new ordinance, uh, A-frames are the same. Uh, but again, I suggested in here we might want to have that discussion about what that really means in the town center area where there's really not any place else but on the sidewalk and the right of way for these businesses to have such signs. Yard signs uh, must be at least two feet behind a sidewalk or six feet behind a curb. And again, I did note in here as I went back and kind of re-reviewed some of this and the other codes I'd looked at, that Gilbert uh, Code specifically does not allow temporary signs in the right of way. I didn't go back to see if they had any nuances for any of their uh, urban core kind of areas or not, I did, but I didn't see anything like that. Aaron, um, I don't know if we've actually looked exactly, I mean, I haven't looked at their ordinance or how they go about getting the uh, permits for that. Um, it sounds like if there are businesses that, so they just, what, just go right, there's a building that goes right up to the right away so they wouldn't be able to put a A-frame down or something like that, then that would seem to be the type that would have to pursue a permit. And I'm not saying it would have to cost or whatever, but it would, at least it would put some control uh, as far as the rights of way uh, go. But Aaron, if you could um, maybe, if you know anything about what Gilbert is doing, that would be great. <laughs> yeah, yeah I, well, that's part of what my, I think my recommendation on this, on this point would be. And the, answer, the direct answer to your question is I don't know a whole lot more than what we've been discussing tonight. But it seemed to my recommendation, and John, I'd, I'd welcome your input as well, would be if we are thinking we want to pursue a, a prohibition on signs in the right of way, recognizing that there could be a few unintended consequences of the nature that John was talking about, is that you direct us as part of this to explore what Gilbert or other municipalities are doing with their prohibitions in the rights of way. And when we come back, say, sure, we can pursue this approach, but we'd recommend the following XYZ exceptions or alternate routes for advertising, since I don't think either of us could really knowledgeably speak about that tonight. Yeah, not as much detail as we probably should, right? Okay. The devil's in the details on these things, so I, I'd want to <clears throat> I'd want to explore that if okay. if we receive direction on this right away thing, that to explore that. Okay. That the other thing that um, later when we talk about encroachment or um, oh, what do they call them, the ones that hang over? I mean, right. if we could be more flexible with that, you know, and, and find a way to try to make it work a little bit more. And it and sounds like Gilbert does that as well. Um, canopy signs, that's what it is. Right. So projecting signs, canopy signs, things like that uh, might be helpful to be able to, um, and, and, and again, I think that's one of the things that Gilbert is looking at too, or, or they have already done. Um, okay, any other questions right now or comments, uh, David? I don't, um, I'm not in favor of um, doing anything that would, um, as far as the signage goes, um, hurt businesses. Um, I specifically went to the bakery over the weekend um, and spoke to the owner who has a lot of business driven to her on the weekends because of the sign that she puts out. People would blow right by and not even see the bakery. Um, so she puts out a sign so she requested that, you know, we be very cautious with limiting stuff like that. Also, the chocolate shop, the chocolatier um, spoke to the owner. Um, he has business that's driven to him by people passing and seeing the chocolate shop sign. Um, also, the vitamin center, uh, the health food center. So I want to be very cautious with, um, especially during this time and what we've already done, um, with COVID and everything. I, I want to be very cautious and help business owners. Um, I understand Councilman Sharna when he, he spoke very eloquently at the last meeting and, and gave some um, examples of, you know, 10 signs on the corner for open houses and everything. I agree that there should be some limitation. 
but to take away a business owner's um, right to um, put that sign out there, especially when um, it's proven that it drives business to them. Um, not everybody is savvy with their phone, so um, you know they might not know exactly where it is. So I just caution, I would be opposed to um, limiting um, a sign for like a restaurant, a bakery, things like that, where they need that um, visual image to get people there. Um, are we, I'm not clear, are we proposing anything that would have an adverse impact on these businesses? Um, I know businesses as well. I mean, believe it or not, it's hard to believe, but I get my hair cut <laughs> and my, my barber's on a side street and she said she gets a lot of walk-in business because of the sign. Are we doing anything that would adversely uh, impact that? Uh, Mayor, Council Member Magazine. Um, so with the draft code as it's come to you at this time, we've tried to leave most of those standards as similar, those provisions in the code as similar as they were to today. Uh, and so that's, but with the idea that we'd have this discussion with the council to see where tweaks, adjustments might be needed. So the, the code today pretty much allows the temporary signs uh, in the places they would have been before. Then this would satisfy, based upon what you said, uh, Councilman Spellick's concern? Uh, I think that's what you're saying. Well, uh, Mayor, Councilmember Magazine, what I was hearing some discussion about is eliminating the ability to put them in the right of way. Right. Today they are allowed in the right of way, and so that would be a change. You'd push them further back from the curb. In some cases, that's a lot and may make it difficult for them to be seen. In other cases, it's not that much of a difference. It's a case by case, site by site uh, distinction. I see. I agree with the Vice Mayor. I feel like we need to allow the signage in the right of way, if we just want to say town center, however we want to do that. But yes, people count on the signs. If, if the sign is too far off the street, somebody's not going to see it because it's just going to blend in. Yes, Terry, the bakery, they get a ton of business off of those signs. Chalk of Finn, pretty much anybody you talk to in town center relies on their A-frame sign. So I really don't want to limit what is their one of their number one marketing opportunities? So if you, if you look at like where they are, so they're in a plaza and that's private property. And so wouldn't their signs be still on private property even if they were on the outside? It's of on that little strip of right away between the parking and the actual street. So it would be considered town right of way property. All the signs. All the signs that I'm speaking about are on the right of way. So, they're, and if, if, to the councilwoman's point, if you move those from the right of way onto their property, then basically the sign would be either in a parking space, which is ridiculous, or up against the building, which unless you're driving and looking, you're you not would not see, see it. it. Well, so. and the track 208 people probably won't even allow it to be on the sidewalk because it's so narrow, it, to, it, it would block the access to the door. So, and, and you're not going to see it. That's my whole point. And, and the vice mayor's whole point is you just will not see it from the street. Well, I mean, I, I understand all that and I, I can't disagree with it. I mean, the, the problem is it, it almost becomes a no win situation because you can't differentiate uh, the restaurant or a bar or a retail establishment versus, you know, we have a lot of storefronts out here that are just uh, service oriented in terms of, you know, real estate and insurance and finance and just, you know, there's a gamut of other businesses out there that some of them already do put the, the A-frames out there and, and, you know, and under, the way you guys are talking, we can't differentiate the content. So all these businesses could have those out there. And it's just, to me, I, I don't know. I mean, I, I don't want to hurt any business either, but I'm, I'm just looking more at bigger picture in terms of uh, uh, aesthetics and clutter and, and safety and those types of things. But uh, it's, I, I just don't know how you can, have, you can't have both. So that's just the way it is. Um, I agree. I think um, 
in some instances, the sidewalks, they're not all uniform. Some are wider, some are smaller. Some are difficult to access, especially for disabled people. So, and I personally, I've tripped over the signs. I think that Aaron's idea to take a look at it and come in for you guys to come do some research on it, come back and see, look at the Gilbert Code, see what their alternatives. So then we can have better options to choose from before making a decision. Yeah, um, Aaron, I suspect it's not legal, but I'll state it anyway. Is it possible to have a permit process where, wherein uh, somebody comes in for a permit to put the sign in the right of way because of special conditions? Yeah, I, I don't, Mayor, Councilman, I don't know of anything that would prohibit, prohibit it. It would just be a question of, yeah, how, how is it structured and what are the requirements? That seems, is what Gilbert does. Seem, seem, they allow permits. Right. Yeah. That, that's right. It seems to me that would go a long way to it solving the problem. That if people, if their signs can't be seen, uh, if they're not in the right of way, uh, if they meet certain criteria, uh, come in and apply for a permit to allow them to do that. Councilman? One, we're asking for them to give us money. Two, then you're turning it back into a more subjective system. It needs to be objective. And if we can't make it objective in our ordinance, then how are we going to tell them what to say to bring to us to get the permit? I think that's why we should just take a look at what Gilbert does. They've obviously have a lot of businesses in, in, those, in that area, that downtown area. Um, how do they handle that? I don't think it necessarily has to cost anything because at one point we had sign um, permit things that we put on the back of signs and at first we started to, we, we uh, charged but then we stopped. It was just a matter of this was a good way to educate how the signs ordinance was um, so we weren't charging. Um, the other thing is if we talk about right away, then we start talking about the directional thing, we, the directional like, um, open house and sign, 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 sign. And we talked about having, you know, five signs. And in Gilbert, they have those open house signs have to get permission from the private, from the whoever's yeah. house it is that they're putting that in front of. So um, I think there might be some answers to be found, not that we're gonna agree with them all, but um, maybe that's, uh, that's one way to, uh, to get around this because I would imagine that Gilbert is, is also very aware of the businesses and, and the hardships that everybody's been going through. Yeah, yeah, Mayor, I would agree with that. And I think if uh, it comes down to uh, no A-frames or come in, get a permit and pay 20 bucks, I think I don't think that's gonna jeopardize any business. And uh, I think it'll go a long way to uh, educating everyone and getting more uniformity out there and not making the job so difficult for our code enforcement folks or staff upstairs. Mayor, if I may, and then in relationship to that, going back to I think where Councilmember McMahon maybe started some of this discussion was, and I'll review this with the attorney, is I think we could say in the shopping center overlay area and the TCCD district that here is the standard and does allow it in the right of way on the sidewalks of the sidewalks, the minimum width and so forth, versus a residential zone where you can't put it in the right of way. Again, we can look at those kind of options that can tailor a little bit more to the different sections of town, make it a little bit easier, a little bit harder uh, based on those zones. So I think that's an option also. I think we could look into that also, but um, I think it doesn't, it still gives us some of the issues that we've been talking about it, even in those areas, unfortunately. So um, so I look forward to, to being able to maybe hammer down a little bit further on what has been done there and what success or problems they've had with it. See here. I guess I just covered a few of the other types that uh, and what happens with them in, in rights away here. I don't think we need to go into them particularly. Um, the residential directional signs was another item that we talked about a little bit last time. Um, again, these are primarily used for an open house or garage sale, but the actual content and use wouldn't be controlled under the code. Uh, but it is replacing those types in the current ordinance. The way it is currently written, you can have one at your property plus five to get you typically from a major street in. And so there's some question last time, uh, do we really need that many? Do we need these at all? Again, you can use your apps on your phone, whatever you can find uh, these things. 
when I wrote this piece. I did model it after the Queen Creek and the Gilbert provisions, which are very similar. The uh, Gilbert, though, in specific, again, does not allow them in the right-of-way. Queen Creek does. Uh, in, in Gilbert, you'd have to go to the property owners and say, can I put one you know, on your property? The Mesa Code doesn't provide for them uh, one way or the other. As a resident of Mesa, I can tell you I see them all the time in the right-of-way and in the medians. Uh, the goal was to not allow them, but we never really could figure out a good way to prohibit them. And so uh, that's what happens there. I know this is subjective, but somehow I think six signs, six directional signs is excessive. We're talking about one at the property plus another five. Um, is that what uh, is allowed in uh, Queen Creek and Gilbert? In uh, Queen Creek, yes. I can't remember for sure in Gilbert if it was five. It's someplace close to that. As we look at you know, how far it can be and how many turning movements you might have to get to get off of Palisades into some place or off of Fountain Hills Boulevard, into an interior lot, you know, five seemed like a reasonable number to staff as, as we looked at it. I've uh, followed directions to various places where it took uh, eight turns. I mean, it's, it's very subjective. Yeah. Um, it it can be like more. a lot of signs and a lot of clutter to me. Um, thank you, Madam Mayor. John, don't we currently um, have people have to have a permit for a garage sale? No. I thought we did. No. And I don't come up with that. So there's They're supposed to use a certain kind of sign, but I, I had a really great idea. <laughs> I'm scratched out. Thank you, Vice Mayor. Well, I just I just thought if we require, a, I I don't know why I thought that we require a permit for a garage sale. If we require a permit for a garage sale and someone's coming in, we could have a sign that would be only allowable that the town would give people that are having garage sales, then all the signs would be uniform. There would be nothing on fluorescent yellow paper with a felt tip marker. I mean, if they're coming in here and they're getting a permit for a garage sale, then we say, do you need signs? And if they say, yeah, these are the only permissible signs you can use to have your garage sale. Then you basically control what signs can go up. So I thought Mayor, it was a really good Mayor, idea. Vice Mayor. Excellent idea, and we've had a similar discussion in our, in our office in terms of our staff that, that do that, uh, uh, Vince Hatcher in particular. He could have a few examples in his truck, and we can't give them to him. We can show them when he takes them back for sign that's wrong and say, here's the type you need to, next time you do one of these, and certainly work with uh, Mr. Larson to publicize this uh, with whatever council ultimately decides so we get as much information out as possible so people will have an uh, opportunity to know what they should be using. I think that's a great idea. And at the same time, we could hand them a piece of paper telling them where they can put them, where they can't put them, right. what they need to be made, made out of, and so on. So I think it's a good idea. Thank you. Council? I mean, the, the town used to do that. Mm -hmm. You know, the town used to do that, but uh, it still doesn't eliminate the problem if there's uh, five garage sales up in northwest part of Fountain Hills, there's going to be five directional signs at Golden Eagle and Palisades. Mm -hmm. You know, so that. You know, we can hand them out, they can look, you know, whatever, but it's, you know, again, if they're in the right of way and they're, you're trying to get people up to your house and your way up there, that's, that corner is, it's critical to make revenue from the garage sale on that. The uh, Gilbert allows for the same approach, like you said, but the signs have to be on private property with permission from the owner rather than in the right of way. So um, that might self-limit that but um if we go that way so it's just something else to keep in mind um the five i don't know you know i don't i at first i thought that sounded like a lot of signs but have we actually looped in a real estate agent and asked them what they thought about six signs total so mayor if i may council member uh through the pnz commission and uh with uh, commissioner dempster who is real estate uh, she looked at this and was supportive of this number. I, I remember a Facebook post probably two years ago now, but someone who was an open house counted, you know, it was like 20 plus signs. So, I mean, so. Well, and then we had some um, fairly recently where there were some that were only like maybe two feet away from each other all along on uh, Fountain Hills Boulevard. So, you know, Liz, I forgot to ask if we had 
uh, any, no, okay, thank you. On any of the other items too, I totally <laughs> forgot. <laughs> thank you. You're probably telling how open we are and then I forget to ask. Thank you. Ready to go on? So well, I heard some discussion about changing the number from the one plus five. I haven't heard any real direction to make that change. So at this point, I'm gonna be leaving it the same unless I get any different direction. Banner permits, another fun topic. So um, as drafted, the uh, permits weren't required. We had that discussion here and I'd already had it with my staff beforehand that we probably really should amend the code to be consistent with the current code and go ahead and require the banner permit. So we plan to make that change. And then flags and flagpoles. So again, the current ordinance, one flag per structure plus one state of Arizona, one four national, one Fountain Hills Unified School District. So you could have up to four, but three of them have specific content requirements under the current code. And the size ranges from 15 square feet for corporate, eight for model home, 60 for the uh, governmental signs with no limit if it's a national holiday. So again, size based on content. We can't do that according to uh, the Supreme Court. So we're going to have to be uniform for all signs regardless of what message it is. Um, so the new code says one pole on single residence is allowed, two poles in all other locations, up to two flags per, per pole, and based on the fact that really most of the flags we see are governmental flags, and the 60 square foot was the allowance for the governmental flags, that's what I put in the code. Uh, we could come back and make some adjustments there based on zoning or some criteria like that, not on content of the sign or not on content of the flag make them smaller in residential, larger in commercial, or however you'd want to go. Um, but again, it couldn't be based on content. Uh, so let's finish that and we'll talk about flags versus banners. Any direction here on any changes you'd like to see? So two, two um, 60 square foot flags could be on one pole. That's what we're saying here? Yes, uh, Mayor, that, that's correct. Uh, again, the, the flag, height of the flagpole is limited by the size of the property and the, and the uh, ordinance allowance for flag for, for height in that zoning district. And then based on that, the flag has to be, um, the sh let's see, how is it? The shorter side can be no more than one third the length of the pole. So can you get two flags on given the size of your pole and the size of the flag? <laughs> Probably, but maybe not in some shorter circumstances and larger flags. But but the poles then are based on the zoning or based on the size of the lot, or how does that go again? It's a combination of that. Uh, it's the maximum height in the zoning district, but you also have to be able to fall and fall on your property. Oh. So it depends on the shape of your property and topography and where you're putting it, that may limit your height below the maximum height. However, there is provision in section 5.07 of the zoning ordinance that when we get to an actual public hearing, we'll discuss that also. It allows for an exemption of that pole height. That's currently based on the fact that you're flying a governmental flag, or we can't mm. base the exemption on that anymore. And our proposal there is gonna be that we just allow the exemption for any flag, because again, most of them are governmental flags, but it still has to fall on your property. Thank so. Mayor. Thank you, Madam Mayor. Um, John, I personally know five residences off the top of my head, of my head who have a flagpole in the front of their yard and a flagpole in the back of their yard. So how are we gonna, how are we gonna address that? Because um, you're not gonna tell these five people that they can't have two flagpoles. Correct. Uh, Mayor, I guarantee it. Yeah, right. Mayor, Vice Mayor, anything that's existing would be grandfathered in. If one of them comes down for whatever reason, then we could say, well, no, you can't put it back, but we're not gonna go out and tell anybody to take a flagpole down. Okay. John, I do have a question. So. I'm just kind of thinking through Fountain Park. We have the Veterans Memorial. We also have, I believe, another location at the park for flagpoles. So mm -hmm. um, how does that work? And I believe the Veterans Memorial, um, correct me if I'm not mistaken, doesn't have three poles. So how does that kind of work? Do we have exemptions for governmental entities for the signed ordinance or? Mayor, uh, uh, Mr. Miller, currently we don't. Um, and it's also been noted that, that out here in front of Town Hall, we have three flags on one of our poles. Right. Uh, at least one of them. 
And so, but at this point, no, we haven't put any exemptions like that in. We could uh, look at a way to provide some I, of those I would like to maybe have that consideration only because we also have two other governmental entities in town mm -hmm. as well, the, the school district that has school sites, also the headquarters or the um, district offices, and then also the sanitary district. Mm -hmm. So um, just some consideration. Okay. I'm not sure if the Legion or the VFW or any of those organizations have flagpoles too out there. So that's, okay. yeah. So you might want to have an exception for that too. Okay. So again, these were somewhat arbitrary numbers for to start with. If we want to allow more flags, more poles, you know, we could do so. What um, I. It just dawned on me that we had an excellent um, letter written this morning to all of us from a resident that took the time to really go into detail. Um, had you had the opportunity to review that and has it played a part in any of this tonight or? Yes, Mayor, Vice Mayor, it has. In fact, you know, that in the, when we started with the A-frames and, and the temporary signs, I guess, and taking out that or lightweight uh, material, that, okay. that was one of the things that came out. And he also spoke about banners uh -huh. um, giving yes. specific examples of someone had a, a baby or a birthday or something like that. I mean, he just had a really well put together, yes. I think uh, yes. it was really well crafted, so. Yes. Okay. Yes, and, and caught, uh, caught a typo for me too, I appreciated that, and so. Uh, um, so, yes, the mayor, so if you're ready, that kind of comes in, uh, vice mayor, to this next topic on the flags uh, versus the banners. And so before I would forget that, one of the things he mentioned in his email was, you do have special things that come up, like having a baby or 16th birthday party or whatever, and maybe somebody wants to, for a very short basis, a few days or a week, put up even a, a paper banner. Um, this would have no provision to allow for that. And so do we want to make that kind of adjustment uh, to the, the uh, code to be something to discuss uh, as we talk about this particular section? Okay. Yeah, I, um, personally, I think that's fine as long as we limit the time mm -hmm. that they can hold, have it up. Okay. Whether it's three days, four days, five days, I don't think it should be more than a week. Okay. I think it should be until the kid turns one. <laughs> <laughs> Do you still? <laughs> uh, <laughs> There's some team has to win the Super Bowl or oh, something. Yeah, but, um, so, uh, what about the paper aspect of it? You want to, if it's really short lived? I don't have a problem with it. Okay. That, yeah. The other thing he had asked about was balloons. Are we talking about balloons? We, have, we haven't talked about balloons. <laughs> um, we, we well, excuse me. With the banners, though, again, we're, we're putting more to do on our two people. But so let's say we say a week. You know we're going to be getting emails and people are going to be on top of it was on it Sunday at 3.04 p.m. and now it's Sunday. And so if they take it down, can it be down for two days and they put it back up for another week? No, not, not my, yeah. sorry, not in my opinion, it wouldn't be able, that wouldn't be allowed. I think most people that want to do something like this know why they're doing it and they're not going to, you know, leave a happy graduation sign up for three months or something like that, you know. I feel, I, I feel like this is one of those sort of, you know, self-limiting things also. No, I was just thinking, is there any way you can require them to put a date on it? But how, how are you gonna, how are you gonna manage that? So, so <laughs> Mayor, then, then I have several questions. Um, and you maybe sort of start to address one, and that is the material. If we are gonna allow the paper or not, I kind of, most people thought I was seeing no's on that, but I'm not sure that's clear. Uh, two is, hey, excuse me, so, I, I want to make sure there's no misunderstanding. Yes. You said there's a no on that for what kind of banner? So it would have to still be a fabric or, or but, uh, vinyl. But not for the ones that people say happy birthday. No, that's why I, I was getting more of the sense you still wanted those to that's be. That's why I wanted to material. clarify. I think, we're say, I think we're saying paper ones are okay for that. Okay. 
As, and you know, we're not saying what it has to say on it, but oh, yeah, there has, that's the thing we have to, t to say <laughs> something like, if it's made out of paper, it can only be up for four days or something right. like that. And I know that we're not gonna really be able to run around enforcing it, but like I said, I, most people just wanna do it for fun and, and I, right. I don't really see a problem right. with it. If it rains, they don't have a problem anyway, it's gone. Right. And so, so, so at this end, are we saying, you know, we, we like it seemed like this past political season, we saw a lot of banners flying on homes for different candidates. So this would not allow that. Is that what we're saying? So currently, the code would not allow any types of banners, regardless of the content, in single-family residential. Okay. If we make this allowance to say you can have a banner for one week then that banner could say anything. Mm. Right. We won't be able to control that content. And to go back to a comment a moment ago, you'd have one thing, the birthday party or the graduation. You may have two of those things in a year. One child turns 16, another one graduates, mm. or whatever. Um, so if we're really gonna limit to, to one for one week, it may be a little bit of a challenge for us to enforce, but, but we could. And, and then the other follow-up question is, are we still gonna require the permit for those just like we would any other commercial banner. Well, I just wonder if we even wanna address it. I mean, if someone puts up a birthday or graduation thing, it's not gonna stay up that long. And I, I mean, I don't think that's an issue that we're tackling or that we need to contend with, but that's kind of my, you know, do we need to address that particular so still leave it, the way, leave it the way it is, that the way we, the way it exists right now, and then with knowledge that that's likely to happen on occasion. Paper. Paper. Yeah. Well, well banners at all, because right now banners are not allowed, and I, you know, I kind of like that. Yeah. Um, what do you think, Ben? Not change it. Um, I agreed we should not change it. Okay. Okay, otherwise about flags and banners, and you, you, I guess we're gonna come back maybe talk about balloons too, but flags and banners is what's in front of me at the moment. So uh, again, we had some discussion uh, about that last time. Uh, and currently, um, um, let's see, the, right now it, the code, the draft code says that uh, part of the definition includes that it's on a pole. We had some discussion last time, well, sometimes flags get displayed draped on the side of a building, and that's true. Don't see it very often, but it does happen. And so to allow that, we would need to remove that part of the definition of a flag. Doing that by itself, I'm a little concerned that we start to lose more of the distinction between what's a flag and what's a banner. And so I looked at uh, some options here of things we could add into the flag definition, such as typically a flag would have some eyelets or be capable of only being fastened on one side versus a banner will typically be from four sides. And so that, keep, again, keeps us a little bit of ability to distinguish what's a flag versus what's a banner. So I would propose if we're gonna take out the pole, we add some language along that line in, help keep that distinct, distinction. Um, if we again, re leave, it, leave the pole part on there. Take, um, take, the, take the pole out, so it could be displayed on the side of a building. On a house. A more like it's gonna be a commercial building, but it could be a house, I suppose. Well, right now, the way banners are allowed on commercial, but not on houses. Right. So Flags are allowed everywhere. And the other part of that is that whether it has the eyelets or the <laughs> right. grommets well, on them, they can drape them on a, on a front wall or something like that, or like up on their porches upstairs and have a banner right. up there, and I don't know that we want that in residential areas. Mayor. Yes. I also don't want to look out my window, as patriotic as I am, and look out my window and see a great big American flag or any other kind of flag. Um, I just don't think that should be allowed. Councilman? There are actually already rules in place for how an American flag can be displayed. Right. So I don't know that we should try to supersede that on a council level. What are the, what are Talk amongst the, yourselves, I'm pulling up. Oh, okay, what are those rules? So Aaron, so the, the Supreme Court ruling really, is that tight that we can't define a, an American flag? I mean, that violates <laughs> yeah. 
you know. It, it, it's Mayor, Council, it is that, that non-discretionary. Uh, the question from Councilman Sharno was, is the Supreme Court's decision in Reed so, so tight that we really can't distinguish between different types of flags, i.e. distinguish from American flag to other types of flags? And the answer, the answer is yes. There's, there's content-based restrictions are impermissible. It's really a non-discretionary matter. Then I think I'd rather just keep the requirement of the poll. I don't know. What do you think? Because it could be any kind of a banner then if we can't differentiate an American flag in residential. Yeah, I mean, your, your attempted work around, I mean, someone could have a, a banner and put some eyelets in it or something and hang it. Oh, no, it's a flag. I, right. I, 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 I don't know. I, don't, I just don't see a good solution here. This is not good. Mayor, Council Member, <laughs> you know, it is tough. The other slight distinction that you have between the typical flag and the typical banner is flags are fabric, banners are vinyl. Again, that doesn't mean you couldn't make a, a banner out of, out of fabric or the other way around. But uh, again, they tend to limit it in most cases. Thank, thanks, Mayor. Um, so if I own a condo, like when I owned a condo back in Chicago, I flew the American flag on holidays off of my balcony attached to my railing. Um, technically an American flag cannot be displayed at night unless it has, it's illuminated. So, um, but if you own a condo and you don't have a pole, uh, I'm very much opposed to that. Uh, I think that someone who owns a condo or someone who's in a town home or somewhere, and they don't have the ability to fly the flag on anything other than maybe, I, I have a friend that attaches it to two nails on the porch above the door for any Veterans Memorial Day, all those holidays. So to say that they can't do that, uh, I'm opposed to that. So. Um, that's just my thoughts. Um, if to satisfy that, could we place a time limit on it? So for example, you have a condo, you wanna throw, throw the flag over your balcony, um, it's probably for holiday, and so you know have a three day limit or something like that. Let's just, uh, one thing about the poles, we're, we're not talking about it has to be a pole in the ground. It can just be the kind that comes, because I have a condo and I just have a Could pole be. on my garage. So that's where I fly the flag. So that that's allowed, that kind of flag. I don't know, I just don't, I don't like banners on the houses. But, you know, it's really- The have codes are, it's really kind of complicated. So it take me a little while to sort through it. But there there are specific rules about how it can be displayed. I don't know that, putting it on a, a, what's the word, railing would be one of them that would be prohibited necessarily. I mean, at this point, it, if we left it the same way it is now, I'd be okay with that. Excuse me, you say the same way, you mean it exists right now. Banners are not allowed in residential mm -hmm. and the definition of a flag made of fabric and so on. Mm -hmm. I'm for that. Okay, Mayor. I'll talk to the attorney though. We might see if there are any options. Don't make me but say I, it I, again. I, I, I hear the, the majority of the council right now. Okay. Um, so political signs, the last favorite topic. Uh, so state statutes, uh, regulate them in the right of way. Uh, 16 square feet in residential, 32 square feet in other areas. Uh, the zoning ordinance regulates on the private property. And so in private property, by the proposed code, uh, only post and board and yard signs are allowed in, uh, in residential. Um, and then, again, you can only use an A-frame as the uh, residential directional in residential, and also it limits the number. And so, Banner signs, we mentioned this a minute ago, that we saw through this last political season, 
uh, really weren't allowed then, but we were changing our sign code, and so we kind of were, were waiting to see where things went. And then, again, clearly not allowed under the new code in terms of on private property. So your only choice for a political sign in your yard in a residential area would be a post, a post and board sign or a yard sign. Um, I guess that was really it that summarized. Uh, Mayor. Uh, John, or maybe this is for um, Aaron. Uh, how is this or is it affected by in HOAs? What if an HOA has a regulation that says no political signs? The, the state says that HOAs can't, but then they're regulating on content. <laughs> I'll, I'll have to, Mayor and Council, I'll, I'll have to take your your word on it. My understand, my recollection the last time I read the statute relevant to HOAs is that there are certain prohibitions as to what HOAs can say and can't say with respect to their their residents. But I, I at this point couldn't go beyond, <laughs> couldn't tell you anything that's, beyond that. That's, that was sort of my impression, and I think it would be helpful to get a clarification on that. I had another question too, John, in your uh, report, political signs, uh, town has regulations prohibiting signs and medians. Um, is that going to apply as well to uh, frontage road medians? So, yes. So currently, again, today, um, we don't allow them frontage road medians or other medians. We had thought about allowing the residential directional signs in the fronted roads medians, but the council made that clear at the last meeting not to do that. So we will be making that change in the draft code. So all other temporary signs and are prohibited from medians, and so uh, political signs would be also. Because we, we, I know there were some put up uh, last year, and I you know, raised the issue, and it was like, well... Supreme Court and everything. So I just want to clarify that it's the center medians and the frontage road medians. Yes. Okay. We just still have the problem of a state statute telling us to do something that the Supreme Court said that we can't do. So, um, so political signs have time limits in the state statute. So they tell us you have to put them, you have to allow them in the right of way some right of ways, but they have to, you know, go up, they can't go up more than whatever, 60 days before an election, and if you're primary, lose your primary, you gotta take it down, if you, you know, and all that. And then after the, the November election, they all have to come down in two weeks or whatever it is. So that's the dilemma, right? So they're telling us we have to allow it, but if we treated every sign like that, if we treated every sign like the state is telling us to treat a political sign, then they would have that same time limit. It's just, it's very much of a dilemma to know what to do because I, uh, you know, to even add on top of that, Fountain Hills, um, whatever it was, 2012, when they came out and said we had to allow some political signs in the right of way, which we never did here, which was such a relief. Um, but they allowed you to have a certain area that was a scenic uh, sign free zone. And since Fountain Hills is a fairly small area, it covered all of Shea all of Saguaro, Fountain Hills Boulevard. So basically, you had this, we have this red line that went all through a map in Fountain Hills that said no, sign, no, no political signs, and that, and that complied with state law and still does. So we technically don't ever have to allow political signs in right of ways in those areas. So that's just something else for you to have to play around with because it's just a, uh, I don't know how to reconcile it. I really don't. And all the, the minds have been working on it and Peggy has a whole big legal uh, opinion about it, but it doesn't really help that much. <laughs> so that's where we're at with that. Uh, you bet. <laughs> we, we didn't discuss the, limiting the number of flamingos for birthdays. Well, if they're balloons made by a professional, then they're okay. Yeah. Well, that's, that's why we've got the yeah, Mayor, we forgot that one a minute ago. You mentioned it, and I said we need to bring it up. We're talking about something else. But the balloons, that was another thing that was brought up in, um, 
an email from Mr. Uh, yes. Mr. Thomas yeah. um, yeah. about a professionally made balloon to take out the professionally made, I believe, was what he suggested in his email. Not sure where you get any other kind of balloon besides a professionally made. <laughs> but um, do we allow balloons oh. now? He also meant, sorry, go ahead. Do we allow balloons now? Yes. Why? Mm. Okay, when we're, talk we're talking about no bigger than I think it's uh, two foot uh, diameter balloons. We don't allow big blow up gorillas or any of those types of things. I'm not uh, going to fight it, but they, they're attached to A-frames. Isn't an A-frame enough? You might not see the A-frame if you're driving too fast. Uh, he also asked us about neon signs and right. the possibility of making sure that they're only on when the business is open. And um, I don't know, do we have, we don't have a, a rule about that, do we, with neon signs that are, because all the neon signs have to be in, right, right. in the windows? Inside the window, right. But they can really leave small. them on all night? They could. Um, do you want to do anything about that? Or no, all these things are manageable now, but then you start thinking mm -hmm. if they were, you know, in every store, what would you think about that? Mike? Well, I suppose we have a few neon signs that aren't just the open signs, right? So can you, you, they could be. Can you differentiate what, that? Or no, not? you couldn't. Hmm? So, would you, so at this point, we're not thinking that we have to do that, say that they have to be turned off when the business is closed? I mean, we can always revisit things too. I mean, if things get out of hand, but right now, you know, the other one is the um, electronic sign that he asked about, which I think you explained at the last meeting why it had to be the 100. 100 nits versus not, the 40 nits. Yeah, yes. he was asking why it couldn't right. be the 40. Could you explain that again? Yes, okay. Um, when we took the, uh, the draft code uh, to the PNZ, working with the Dark Sky uh, Committee, uh, they had recommended the 40 nits uh, from their studies and some national publications that they had. And so that's what we had at that point. Following that, we, we had uh, some further uh, review and input, uh, working with uh, some sign companies and the uh, Arizona Sign Association, and really delved in deeper to the ability to get to anything less than 100 nits. And it turned out, it was, with the technology available, it's really rather difficult to do that. And so we all agreed to just stay with uh, the 100 nit that's in the current code. But the draft codes that came to you, because that was what the PNZ had recommended, is still in there, but our intent has been to change it to the 100. Okay, and um, and like you said, the dark skies, because he had questioned that, and that was, they were all fine yeah. with it. Then the and, other part. And, they, I, and I did reply to him with some of this information. Oh, too, thank you. Yes. Um, and then another thing for future reference, are those actual electronic signs, which are, you know, they're, they're um, expensive, and so we don't see a proliferation of them, but as we discussed before, there is no limit on them. And um, if we uh, decide this later, um, is it possible to restrict them as far as how many are in a certain area or how close, you know, we, like you said, trying to take that back after having, them, having it available, but we haven't had a lot of, a lot of businesses take, it, take us up on it. Um, is that something that can be limited through location? Um, Mayor, as long as we are regulating time, place, and manner, then we can regulate. It again, just does start to get difficult the more that are out there. Figure out what those distinctions are and what the criteria would be. Thank you. Oh, Councilman? Yeah, I'd, I mean, I'd like to look into that a little bit more, and um, maybe you could come back with uh, possible ways to deal with that whether it's turning them off at certain times, location, whatever. I know you'd have to grandfather in the ones that are there, but uh, I think it's worth taking a look at. Thank you. Anything else for the good of this item? No? Oh, my, we, uh, we uh, gave you a lot to, to think about, and I know, I'm sorry, go ahead. No, I'd just like to make a comment. Uh, this is very complicated stuff, and uh, I want to thank John and his staff. Uh, they've done a superb job, not only on this, but we've had some other uh, complicated issues in the past, and the quality of the staff work, as far as I'm concerned, is unsurpassed. Thank you. I appreciate the team that uh, helped me out. Thank you for saying that, Councilman, and I'm sure we all agree. Um, when, when I, I didn't even want to look at the agenda when this came out, like, oh, what was it going to say? And it was like, wow, I actually get it. So uh, you, you, you narrowed it down for us. Really appreciate it. Thank you. We'll be back. <laughs>
And so our, our last item, it, it's uh, anybody that's been on these calls with the league or been following anything um, knows that they've introduced more bills this year than ever. <coughs> um, it's really difficult to keep up with all of them, but we're doing the best we can. And Grady, do you want to start? Sure. Um, on, on the one this morning, um, it, there were some bills that just we hadn't heard of before that um, seemed like they just popped out of nowhere. Um, the one that um, I think is very concerning to us as we're starting to with our new community relations position and really trying to reach out more and more and using social media, I was just very dismayed to see that uh, Senate Bill 1687 um, was basically trying to make it um, prohibit, prohibit the use of governmental use uh, for a governmental purpose to communicate using social media with its residents or uh, people. And it, it's just very interesting because I, I think this is a very powerful medium and I think it's gonna continue to be more and more important to how people communicate in the future. Um, on that, I'm wondering if I can get a council position of opposition that we can register on this. I totally support being against that because we already hear that we're not transparent enough and Facebook is one of our ways we tell people we'll communicate with them. I mean, and, and let me get it straight too. I mean, there is a reason the sponsor did go into it and that's just because we saw during the last election that um, uh, Twitter and Facebook and some of these other um, social media sites have like their own um, regulations and rules and, and guidelines. Mm -hmm. And so they can shut down people and so forth. And so um, so I believe that's where um, the sponsor was coming from that, that didn't think that that would be necessarily appropriate for governmental use that that can happen. So I understand where that thought process was into this, but I do think there might be a better way to approach it rather than just having a prohibition, absolutely. So if pretty much any website you use, they've got their own set of rules. So if we go with um, GoDaddy to run our website, GoDaddy has a set of rules. So exactly. if we don't own it, we got to follow somebody else's rules. So it looks like there's a consensus on that. Um, so I'll go ahead and, and register in opposition to uh, Senate Bill 1687. Um, the other one I wanted to bring up, it's very important. It comes up every year or two, and that's um, House Bill 2211 or Senate Bill 1721. It has to do with prime contracting and it comes up every so often where we get a large share of our um, uh, construction sales tax um, at the site where we have construction activity occurring in our town. And this has come up every so often where they wanna to try to have the point of sale where the construction materials are actually sold. So this could be like a Phoenix could be getting all the construction sales tax that should actually be here. Now they have raised the threshold to be about a million dollars, um, but I still think, and the, the league has taken a position that this is really bad uh, public policy for cities and towns. Um, and so I would like to see if the council would support um, us putting a, you know, registering opposition to this particular bill, because it would take away potentially revenue away from smaller cities and towns like us that don't have like a Home Depot or, or have you know, a, a, a rail depot where people can pick up their building materials coming off the train. Move we on. better, wait, wait, wait. Uh, because there's the, the uh, 1721 is actually um, a good bill. The, well, I was the, referring the to The one we need to oppose is the 2211. Yes, 2211. Thanks okay. for the clarification, Jenny. Thank you, so go ahead. No, just a move, <laughs> move that we oppose the bill. Agreed. Yeah, I think there's a, enough consensus. I'll, if we get to one where there's, where we need to have a vote, we'll, we'll, we'll ask the mayor to call for a vote on. Okay. If, if you're okay with that, mayor. Okay. Because my understanding is we don't have to actually have the council vote on it. The way I'm communicating via letter to these legislators is that you have communicated to me your desire on these bills. The uh, other thing is that Grady's going to um, send us the when he sends in the these so we can keep track of what we've already weighed in on too because it's just an avalanche. Um, the one that I think you're all familiar with, we actually had a um, one of our honorary consuls, uh, Enrique Melendez, had asked for support for bills that would allow the um, members of the consular corps to use their consular IDs um, 
So that would require cities and towns to accept that as an official um, form of ID if they are stopped by police or um, so forth. I think that that is one that um, it appears that Lake has no issue with that at all, and that would be a, a very positive. I don't know if any of you have. There were three bills. It was House Bill 2685, 2458, and Senate Bill 1420. They, they have very similar um, um, variations. I mean, they, they do vary, but they're all pretty much still allowing this type of use. So I was this bill was... Um you gave me permission to vote yes on it when it became part of the agenda for the league. So just to, it's the same thing. Okay. So yeah, I think that's fine, right? Okay. And then, let's see. Those are the biggest ones that I pulled out. Um, and I know there were a number of you that were on those calls um, this morning and last week. So. I'll stop there, Mayor, unless there's any other uh, bills that you want to bring up or anybody well, else has bills. SCR 1040, eliminating the income tax that in, in its entirety in the state of Arizona, which would, uh, you know, be about 850 million to cities, <laughs> not to mention what it does to the state. So uh, we may want to... Uh, That's an important one. It's on an agenda, so I think it might be good to, to uh, weigh in on that one. I'd be happy to talk about those. Yeah, that was so, a bit, that's important. So, um, yes, as the council member is bringing up, um, there's two similar bills um, having to deal with building permits. The first one is um, 2716, House Bill 2716. Um, it basically says that um, residential building permits uh, must be approved within seven days. Um, can't prioritize the, the ones that might be in the queue. If they're not approved within the seven days, um, then they can get a temporary um, building permit, which basically, and temporary in, in organizations like ours is they can just start constructing. Mm -hmm. um, the other one is House Bill 2861. Um, basically, that is kind of silly. Um, sorry for the way to describe that, but <laughs> It basically says that um, cities and towns cannot charge more than a cost to review or expend um, for the services in order to review and, and issue the building permits. And as you know, most cities and towns all have to go through, they all go through like a cost of service study that looks at all that. So I don't, that's kind of ridiculous because the state holds that. I believe there's some other state law that requires us not to charge and make a profit off of our fees. So those are two bills. I, I'm kind of seeing a lot of heads nodding on that, that it appears that those really um, would not be good for, for the town if those were to pass. Yeah. Thank you, Peggy. You have a bill, right? Even with the new software that you guys are going to have to be able to prove stuff, you're, that uh, seven days is still tough. And you yeah, can't we'll skip, if you have commercial stuff, you can't skip the commercial stuff to get to the point. residential stuff because of the seven days. Right. Yeah. Thank you. Alan? Yeah, I have two pieces of legislation I want to bring up. Um, the first one is gun legislation, um, which is similar to one that was vetoed by Governor Brewer a few years ago. And I asked in advance, I asked uh, Aaron if he would give just sort of a brief description of what this is, and then I'll have some comments. Mayor and Council, my understanding of the bill, as worded, and it requires a little bit of background explanation, is the st state statute currently prohibits bringing a firearm into a, into a public establishment, unless there's a you know if we if we we can require that there's a storage in a locker, uh, which we which we have <coughs> signs posted out there. My understanding of the bill is that it changes that requirement to say anyone who brings a fire brings a, a it says deadly weapon but it would apply to firearms a deadly weapon into a public establishment or to a public event and who i think has a concealed carry permit would be allowed to do so um unless except for some limited limited exceptions um one of the requirements would be that if the, the public establishment is a secured facility i want to make sure i get this right they could not bring them into a secured facility, a secured facility being defined as you have, 
either a security guard or metal, metal detectors or something like that. So the upshot of it, to my knowledge, and this is just on my reading, is that you know we, the town itself would not be able to prohibit entry uh, or bring, bringing a, a, a deadly weapon into the facility unless we were to institute some sort of security protocol at the, at the entryway. Did I, did I get that right? Okay. Mm -hmm. Yeah, right. except for what I consider the most important part, um, where it names specifically public libraries, churches, mm -hmm. hospitals, publicly owned spaces, um, libraries, and so on. It specifically allows uh, weapons to be carried into those spaces uh, if, if there's, uh, unless there's a guard or a lockbox. Um, I think this is the height of irresponsibility. Uh, I looked uh, at the 2020 U.S. Secret Service Threat Assessment Center study and identified 34 incidents in which three or more persons were harmed during a targeted attack in a public or semi-public space in the U.S. between January and December 2019. Open space, 11 incidents. Education, three incidents. House of worship, two incidents. Um, then I looked at, uh, at libraries, and I didn't do a deep dive, but I found one incident in a library. It was a 17-year-old fellow in Clovis, New Mexico, uh, who ended up in prison. A um, lot of concerns. Um, people with guns in facilities like that, there can be a lot of crossfire. A lot of innocent people get injured and killed. Um, we have 91, and I mentioned open spaces, own, um, publicly owned open spaces. There are 91 cities and towns in Arizona. There are 31 state parks in Arizona. We have local parks, five local parks, and many other publicly owned spaces like the dog park. Um, and I believe previous legislation indicated that no training for the use of these weapons was required. Um, so the question becomes, first of all, I think it's a ridiculous piece of legislation. Um, Who's going to pay for the guards? Who's going to pay for the lock boxes? Uh, it could cost millions and millions of dollars statewide. Um, I don't think the governor is going to take a billion uh, take the money out of his rainy day fund to pay for these. So it would be foisted on local governments. And if local governments can't afford it, which in our case I don't think we probably can, then it's open season. Um, I proposed this morning that the bill be forwarded to the East Valley Partnership Executive Committee to take a position. Um, and as I said, and I think this is uh, in the Senate now, is that correct? It's been approved by the House, Aaron? I'm pretty, well, I'm, I'm pretty sure that's... It's on, it's in the rules and then it will go on the rules, right. Yeah, so I'd, uh, I'd like to make a motion um, that we oppose this bill and notify the governor and legislators. Thank you. This is 2551, and um, one of the things you started to mention, uh, Aaron, was some of the exceptions to it. And um, one of the exceptions is um, law enforcement area, uh, courts, you know, judges, and um, also prisons and uh, prosecu prosecutorial offices. So when I see, and there's a lot, there's a, several others, but when I particularly see that. I have to wonder why they are exempted. Uh, I would assume it's because they feel that it's dangerous to have guns in those spots. I don't, I don't know why they would be not dangerous here <laughs> or at the community center, um, but, they, but, but not allowed in law enforcement or courts. Also, any place where it's prohibited by federal law, um, public uh, in vehicles. Um, so there's, a, there's enough places that, that are exempt that make you think it, somebody thinks it's a little bit of a dangerous idea. So um, I would be in favor of opposing it um, because, I, and, and you mentioned you don't think the governor would you know, be able to pay for all the cities, but the state buildings would have to do it too, so he'd have to pay for that, you know, yeah. one way or the other. Either so, that or just let people go in with their guns. Well, yeah, and that's true, that's true. So. Um, anyway, I'm okay with, with opposing that. Yes, Councilman, Vice Mayor, geez. Um, Aaron, is, I'm not familiar with this bill at all. Is this saying that it's strictly governing people that have a concealed carry permit or just the general public? 
The bill allows for a person who possesses a valid concealed weapon permit to be exempt from the prohibition on carrying a concealed weapon in a public establishment or at a public event. Okay. Correct. Well, um, I don't know if anybody up here is familiar with the process of getting a concealed carry permit in the state of Arizona, but it's not easy. So there's extensive training. There's a background check. You can't be a convicted felon, and there's other things too. Um, the statistics, I think, Council Member Magazine is quoting, I would be shocked if the offenders in these incidents or if the, the statistics he's quoting are people that had concealed carry permits that did the killing. So I would doubt that. Um, the only thing that can stop a bad guy with a gun is a good guy with a gun. So, um, if it's strictly limited to concealed carry permits and people that have concealed <laughs> carry permits, um, I will not approve this at all. So, Mayor. Yeah, I, I think, uh, I'm not positive of this. I'm all, quite certain that the statement that requires extensive training is not correct. I believe there was legislation two years ago that removed that, that no training is required to get a, uh, a permit. That's not true. We I qualify every year as a retired law enforcement officer. I have a, what's called a LEOSA card, which is a federal card, which gives me the permission to carry anywhere. So I qualify yearly for that card. I go through an extensive qualification process for that card and it's yearly. So, um, I know people that have that are not law enforcement, retired law enforcement, that have concealed carry cards that qualify with that. So, let me let, let me make this easy. Whether they're trained or not, I think this is a bad bill. I'm opposed to approving this. So, Mayor, um, I did hear. I think it, this is the perfect example of when we do want to have a vote on it, just so that. So there was a motion. There, I don't believe there was a second on it. Actually, if if I can comment. I'm a layperson with a CCW. Let me read to you what the website of the place that I got my CCW from. Um, the requirements are 21 years of age, be a US citizen or lawful resident, submit to a back com criminal background investigation, not be a prohibited possessor, not be a substance abuser, not have a domestic violence conviction. I can email this to you later, Liz not a convicted felon. So they do run a background check. They actually check your fingerprints while you're there. It is a four hour class that you can qualify with. Technically, you are supposed to have some sort of gun training. The Scottsdale, one of the places that I looked up says for their four hour class, while it does not include any live fire or written examination, the course does meet minimum Arizona legal requirements and will provide an Arizona concealed weapons license. Their requirements say you have to be at least 18 years of age, must be 20 and a half or older to receive the actual permit. I don't know about the 20 and a half, that, that just we, seems weird. You also have to have a pad and pencil and a willingness to learn. Those are the requirements from that particular place. When I got my CCW, I was told everybody, we had a whole room of people. We were told everybody needs to be able to load their own magazine. Not a big deal, I can do that. The couple in front of me, she could not, he could. He loaded it, handed it to her, so she had a loaded magazine when they went out. We did go out to the range. I don't remember what he said. He said maybe fifth, fist, or maybe he said four or five inches, a little clumped together. We had practice rounds and that's pretty much, we shot five rounds in our little group and that was pretty much it for the on-site part. Yes, the background part is huge. I'm not, I mean, that, that's pretty significant. When you go to buy a gun and you have your CC card, your CCW card is actually a little faster process to buy it because of the background check you have run on you. What is, does anybody know what the purpose of this bill is? Mean? Well, I mean, I'm, I can only assume from reading the bill that it, it is to allow people with a concealed weapon 
to enter these facilities. Why would I think you it's need one? I think it's as simple as that. I, I guess I don't think the bill is necessary. I think there's enough regulation about guns and concealed weapon permits, et cetera, that I, I guess I can understand why someone would need to take a concealed weapon into a library. And, and I, want, I want to ask this just in you know, total good faith, because you guys, did, what, why would it not be allowed in a law enforcement or in a courtroom? Why would this same bill not be okay, let's just say, in a courtroom? Well, first off, there is no courtroom that doesn't have courtroom security. So when you go to court, if you're in plain clothes, entering a court, you have to show your star and your ID. And anybody that um, has a concealed carry permit, you're not gonna get past the metal detectors because you're gonna secure your weapon. Because in a courtroom, you have domestic violence cases going, you have people seeking orders of protection, you have criminal cases and things like that. So that's, that's the answer for a courtroom. And you're not gonna carry a weapon into a police facility, there's lock boxes also for that. But, but I guess so, let's just, I'll get, I'll get to the point here, right? We have a court right there and we have police. So, but we don't have metal detectors and we don't have anything like that. So I guess it's hard for me not to interpret that this means that they, that this is a dangerous thing to allow in a courtroom or in a prison, or in a, any place where arms are prohibited by federal law, or in a prosecutorial office, in a college, community college, or a university that's um, part of the state, a healthcare district, or an Arizona state hospital. So when I see all these exceptions, I have to wonder why they are exempt. If, if not for the idea that it might be a dangerous idea to have them there. And in that case, I think it's a dangerous idea to have them here and in the library and the community center and all, and at events, public events. Uh, so that's, that's, it's hard for me not to come to that conclusion. Are, are, are you, are either you or anybody up here that would, are, do you, are you not thinking that people do not carry weapons into the library here? or do not carry weapons into this when, when they come for council meetings? You don't think that there's people that have been in this audience armed? I can tell you right now, I know a number of people that carry their guns everywhere they go in their purse or wherever, whether it be the library or the museum. I've never actually seen those people in this room, but I assure you they would bring them in this room. Yeah, Mayor, that's a hell of a lot different than inviting people to bring them in. With, with a law like this, getting the publicity it gets, I can just see the numbers of people who are who are cheating and bringing things in grows exponentially. If he wants a vote, let's vote. He said he wanted a vote. Okay. Let's vote. There's a motion and a second. We have a motion to um, uh, put in a position of. I didn't, I didn't hear the second. I, I, I know, that's what I'm saying. We have a motion to uh, oppose <coughs> House Bill 2551. Do we have a second? I'll second it. Thank you. Um, all those in favor, please say aye. 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 Any opposed? Nay. Nay. Thank you. Do you want me to do a roll call? Did you get it? I got it. Okay. Okay, motion passes four to three. Thank you. And just let me also mention that this is a, a league, the league opposes this bill too. So um, cities in general, we're opposing it mostly on the money aspect of it. Yeah. Mayor, I have a second uh, very non-controversial bill to discuss. Uh, if you folks saw the Arizona Republic today, it indicates that the Senate has approved uh, a new school voucher bill, the empowerment scholarship accounts. Um, a smaller bill was defeated two years ago by the citizens in a referendum, 65% to 35%. This bill is worse. It makes eligible for scholarships. Uh, it, the last one made eligible for scholarships, 9,700 students. This one, it's 650,000 students. Um, it allows parents to take money from the public schools, essentially, and, and uh, spend them on uh, private schools. Um, 
the new bill would allow any student who lives in the boundary of a Title I school to be eligible. And the contention is that if it's a Title I, Title I um, uh, school, then it must be lower income people. So therefore, this is gonna help lower income people. That's a farce. Low income people can't afford the stipend it takes to get into these schools. It, I think the last time it was like 3,000, over $3,000. Um, according to the story in the, in the, in the Republic, uh, there are more than 2,000 district schools, that are Title I schools, and they include many wealthy families. And as I said, more than 650,000 students would be eligible. Um, this is taking money, in my view, away from the public schools at a time when we have tremendous, tremendous problems. Uh, teacher shortages to the point where people are teaching in the classrooms that have no qualifications to teach. And here we are taking more money away from uh, the public schools. I, th I think it's a very bad bill, and I move that we approve it, that we oppose it. Any other questions? It wasn't this what we all voted on in 2018. That's what, that's what I said. It was it was 65 uh, percent opposed. So to it, now they're going support. against what the state's voters voted that they wanted. Just making that clear. Um, without arguing the merits of the proposal one way or the other, I'm just wondering if that's something the school board should take up. I, I'm, I mean, I know we, a lot of our issues are city and town related. I'm just wondering as far as our purview on an issue like that, if it's something we should take a position on per se. Yeah, I have a response. I think it's, uh, it affects uh, our students, our families. Um, I don't think we should draw a, a, a straight line between what, uh, what the school board can do and what the council can do. Um, we're sworn to protect the health, safety, and welfare of our citizens. And I think this is very appropriate that we take this position. I'll abstain from voting on this due to the fact of my full-time job being employed by the Arizona Department of Education, but I'd be interested for Council Magazine to tell me what schools are hiring teachers that are not qualified. If I were president of the uh, Teachers Association, I could cite all of them. What I'm saying is I have read it many times over. There were statistics recently um, in the papers and everything that showed that there were uh, hundreds, hundreds of people teaching that didn't have teaching certificates. To me, that means they're not qualified. Okay, well. I think that the qualifications changed. I think that's what the intent is. If you teach in a if you teach in a public school in the state of Arizona, you need a teaching certificate. People that teach in charter schools do not need to be certified to teach. Alan, you're not going to tell me my job. I'm telling you you're wrong, whether it's your okay. job or not. Well, if you're using the Arizona Republic as your news source, find another news source. I wouldn't line my birdcage with that paper. So I'm telling you that in the state of Arizona, if you teach in a public school, you have to be certified and be a certificated individual to hold the teaching position at a public school. If you teach at a charter school, you do not. You do not need any type of certification to teach at a charter school, but if you teach at a public school, you need to be certified. Let's put that argument aside and let me ask, do you think we have a sufficient number of qualified teachers in Arizona? We're well over 3,500 teachers short in the state of Arizona. That's not your point. Uh, is there a second on this motion to oppose? Second. Thank you. Um, all those in favor of opposing the, uh, I don't know what the bill number is, do you? Uh, no. 1452. Um, all those in favor of opposing, please say aye. 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 Any opposed? Thank you. Um, I want to answer one thing um, about the short-term rental bill, which was uh, Rep. Kavanaugh's bill. It got out of the uh, committee eight to five. There were a little, wasn't an easy. So um, whatever you can do to help support this bill to get it through, uh, House Bill 2481, it's got to have to go to the floor and then.